Hello, YouTubers. This is another session where we get to talk to a lot of pioneers in the tech industry, people that change the lives of millions of software engineers around the world, sometimes by creating new technologies, sometimes by creating content to guide, you know, to, you know, uh, software engineers to build greater software, and sometimes just inspirational stories, how they started, how they grew up in the tech industry, and how they became some of the most influential people in our industry. And without any further ado, I'm today joined by my brother here, Tim Corey. Tim is a very popular figure in the software industry. He teaches millions of people. This is the guy that is teaching people he will never meet. He reaches every corner of the earth. You know, while he's asleep, he's helping people learn software engineering and get jobs. Like, like the amount of people that Tim have impacted, you know, in the past, I don't know, 10 years now, Tim, how, how long have you been doing this? Seven, 10 years? Eight years for you too. Eight years. Yeah. Wow. Almost a decade, a decade worth of dedication. So that, you know, I don't know if, if you're familiar with it, but the 10,000 10, hours outliers, you know, this is just such dedication that, you know, someone I even aspire in a million years just to be someone like, you know, in terms of being able to reach out to people and, and deliver such high quality, you know, world class content, something that people you could just sit there and listen to Tim all day and not get enough of Tim. You know, you just want to listen to the brother all day while you're eating, while you're sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> so, you're pushing it, but okay. <laughs> so, so Tim, welcome. How are you doing? Thank you. I'm doing excellent. Awesome. Yeah, awesome. It's uh, thank you again so much for kind of, you know, taking the time to kind of hang out with me a little bit. I know it's a Friday afternoon, Friday and TGIF, you know, and, uh, you know, I wanted to kind of learn a little bit more about you and kind of help kind of the world know a little bit more the personal side of Tim, the inspirational sure. side. How did you become that kind of person? Tell us a little bit about yourself, Tim. What do you think? Go ahead. So I've been a developer for, oh goodness, it's been 25 years, I think, this year. Nice. Um, so I actually started, actually my grandfather when I was 12 gave me an old NEC computer and nice. had no hard drive. It was just, you know, just DOS and I got to play around a little bit. And that was really, for me, that was, that was the fun. That was the, the, the thing I love doing. I love, you know, video games and all the rest, but really it was... Yep coming back and writing a little bit of code and seeing it actually do something. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so that was really my, you know, my start was mm -hmm. way back then. And then, you know, I, I, every chance I got when I worked at a job, I was actually working as an intern for an engineer mm -hmm. and my job was just, you know, do this, do that, you know, uh, simple stuff. And mm -hmm. he gave me boxes and boxes and boxes of printed out handwritten uh, manual spreadsheets yeah you know spreadsheet, and just yeah. said just said enter this in the computer and so that's when i started professionally started doing things like hey i can automate this hey i can yep. make this easier and and he saw something in me and gave me more more jobs once i blew through all that work it gave me you know real developer jobs mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that really started you know where i am today is just that confidence somebody else had in me to hey go ahead and do it you know um take some time nice. and learn how to do it, build it up, you know, encouraging along the way. And that was, that was a really big deal for me as um, one of my first bosses that really saw something in me and, and pushed me to do more. And that was, that was a great start to my career. It's, it's always nice to have kind of a support system that kind of helps you. And I'm assuming, Tim, tell me this, there, there must have been moments where you were struggling with something, thought maybe this is not for me, you know, I mean, imposter syndrome, all of us kind of run into a sure. situation where, you know, I don't know if this is for me, you know, maybe I should do something else. Have you ever had to experience any of that? Just every day. So <laughs> <laughs> I joke that there's dents in my desk from my head hitting it repeatedly. <laughs> um, as I, you know, this is an easy thing to fix and no, it's not. Um, yeah, I, so when I, my first full-time job as developed, so I was an intern, worked as an engineer for a while. And then um, after my first, my freshman year of college, um, I dropped out because I didn't want to go into debt, go into college. And so I started working back for the company I interned for. And then one of the, my fellow interns uh, had started a software development consulting company. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, he said, Hey, do you want a job? And of course. Yeah. 
Yes, yep. I do. Um, <laughs> Thank you. And, yes. <laughs> yeah. And, and really, it became one of those things where I was like, hey, I'm getting paid to do what I wanted to do. So why would I go to college for this? So, yeah. but I spent six years there. Okay. And he was an excellent boss, but he was not necessarily a boss that held your hand, mm. but more like a, hey, there's a deep end of the pool and then give you a kick in the back. Um, <laughs> go. And, you know, <laughs> swim. Um, so we did a lot of things where I was in way over my head. Um, mm -hmm. And really, you know, that, um, that despair of will this ever be solvable? Will I mm -hmm. ever be able to figure this out? And of course, then I was self-taught. So there was this whole ecosystem around me that I didn't understand, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, I actually have a video on my YouTube channel about imposter syndrome. And I think one of the things I covered in there was, it was about a decade after mm -hmm. I became a professional developer that mm -hmm. I even knew what source control was. Wow. You know, and wow. it's it one yeah. of those things where you know, I'd walk into the room and there'd be developers talking about source control and I felt yep. like an idiot. What like, is that? <laughs> you know, I, I don't, I don't know. And so, like everybody else knows everything that I don't know, and yeah, you know, and so yeah. there's that that feeling of I don't want to be around other developers. Like, I know that I'm falling short, and I don't even know where I'm falling short mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. all the time. And so it was just that that constant. How, how did you, how did of, you over? Uh, 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 yeah, that, that constant fear of of am I good enough? And of course, yeah. the answer when you tell yourself is always no. Yeah, um, yeah. But as far as overcoming it. Um, well, there's always going to be that that voice in your head. You know, yep. there's always that voice that you're not good enough, especially when you meet other people. Because what you tend to do is you look at that person's strengths mm -hmm. and then you mm -hmm. compare that to your weakness. Yeah. So guess what? You're never good enough. You're never going to win. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Never. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, I, I talk to people, I say, you don't compare yourself to others because they were where you were at one point yeah. in life. Yeah. You know, no, yeah. no one was born knowing this stuff. Yep. You weren't, there's, there's no like way to somehow just get it by osmosis. You've got to yep. go through the pain of learning it. Yep. And so where you are is not where they are. And they may be 10 years down the road from where you are. Yep. But you may be 10 years down the road from where they are in a different subject. So yep. what you got to yep. do is compare yourself to yourself. Yep. Um, yep. And so if you look at yourself six months ago, um, you know, I do this a lot because you, yep. you look at your own code. Yeah, you you, yep. you pull up a, a thing that you wrote a year ago, and you're like, "Who is the idiot who wrote this?" And you're like, <laughs> that's how you know you're growing. I'm yes. the idiot. I'm yes. The, and that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Because if you say, you know, who is the idiot that wrote this, then that means you've progressed as a developer, and you're yep. doing better than you were. Yep. And really, that's all you can do. You have to compare yourself against yourself. Yeah. If you've yep. made progress, then you're doing great. Yep. Yep. So, so let me ask you this. You know, just out of curiosity, like. You know, you 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 know, the way you describe this actually, I think it would bring a lot of peace to people's minds because you know, a lot of people think that if you're not competitive in the software market, as in not healthy competitive, but more like, oh look, you know, he 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 knows about this thing and I don't, right? This whole com comparison thing, I struggled with this myself when I was younger. You know, my parents would be like, oh look, the neighbor's kids have better grades and all that. And I'm like. <laughs> Just, just let the, should I give them a gift? What do you like? What's, you know, so, so, so let me ask you this. Can you actually be, you know, a, a, a exceedingly efficient at something without having to de to be competitive against someone else, but rather than yourself? Yes. I mean, I, okay. Let's take me for example, because, you know, I am never going to be the best um, in most areas. I'm just mm -hmm. not. Um, and that's okay. Yeah. Um, that's, that's something that, you know, there's, I teach a lot about C sharp. Um, and I don't teach everything. And yeah. part of the reason for that is because I don't know it all. Um, okay. I'm not going to teach machine learning because my goodness, that's complicated. And okay. it's not my area, you know, <laughs> so if you want to teach machine learning, go for it. Um, but that's not me. So uh -huh. there's a lot of areas like that where you don't have to be it's the just best. not your, you yeah, to, yeah. You know, just, just be better. Yeah, um, because you're you're better every day. Um, that's really all you can really strive for. Um, you can't that's always progressing. Be, mm -hmm. Yeah, not mm -hmm. everyone's a rock star. And that's OK. I'm not yeah. a rock star. Um, that's OK. I think you're a rock star, but that's a stir for another day. <laughs> you know, I, I think you're more than a rock star. I'll, I'll tell you why. I, I'll tell you a couple of things about you. You know, uh, it, it just just remember this, you know, you engineered 
you engineered mentorship in a way that scaled out. You scaled yourself, right? Someone out there, right at this very moment, while you and I are talking right now, is writing code better because he watched a video where you were teaching people that stuff. So speaking of teaching, how did that start? How did you just did you just wake up one day and you said, I'm going to slap on a camera on top of my <laughs> monitor and I'm going to start telling people things? <laughs> not, not even not even close. Um, but so I actually I worked for a, a university for seven years. Um, okay. I did a little bit of teaching there. I loved it. Oh. Uh, but it was mainly like just side stuff once in a while. But then I was approached by a community college uh, director. Um, mm -hmm. And she said, you know, we need, desperately need uh, C-sharp teachers. And mm -hmm. it didn't conflict with my schedule. So it was at night. Mm -hmm. um, once a week, we'd, we'd do uh, three, three and a half hours of C-sharp teaching once a week for 16 weeks. Okay. Um, and I, I loved it. I loved it. Um, I would still be there if I could. Because yeah. just, you know, there'd be 24 or so new students every, every semester. And they'd come in knowing nothing. Yeah. And sometimes we, I've had students that came in that had gone through the course before I taught night classes nice. and they'd gone nice. through the day class and they had failed. Mm -hmm. And I had one student who, um, she said that she came into my class as a last resort mm -hmm. and thought that she was just not good enough to learn C sharp. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she graduated, I think she got an A in my class. Wow, um, nice. And she became a developer. And yeah. it, it, I love that. I love people to say, hey, relax. It's okay. You know, again, it comes back to, I don't see myself as a rock star because I've had a struggle for everything. And so I, I love being able to say, hey, I've gone down all the wrong paths. Mm -hmm. Why don't mm -hmm. I teach you the right paths? Nice. And we'll make this easier. And nice. so... We cover a lot of stuff in my courses that you know, the head of my department came to me and said, you know, are you having a hard time teaching this? Because all the other professors are. And I'm like, not, not at, all. at all. I love this. This makes sense. You know, yeah. It, it, because, you know, it was, it's a lot of fun to be able to tell a, you know, teach a student, bring them along and say, hey, you can do this. Uh -huh. you know, and that uh -huh. was my favorite thing was being able to say, you can do this. Even uh -huh. the, the student who's struggling, you know, the one who said, I'm not sure if I can. Uh -huh. um, and so, that was really energizing for me to be able to, to help and be a help for that. And so that's where I, my YouTube channel actually started was okay. I taught once a week. Well, if you teach for three, three and a half hours once a week, if you're a student trying to take in three and a half hours of the fire hose it's hard yeah, and it's then hard. walk away for seven days, yeah, you're lost. Yeah. You know? And so I, I created a, the world's worst YouTube channel. <laughs> that was okay. really what it was. Um, I had a, uh, uh, I had Camtasia and I had a USB microphone. Camtasia, which was like, I that, that was that's the you know, pinnacle of my technology, and <laughs> it was a, a computer in the corner of my bedroom. Actually, the laundry room was through our bedroom, and so my wife would sometimes do laundry. Yep. While I was on the microphone <laughs> teaching, because it wasn't about like the presentation value was. Not yeah, it's there just about okay. bringing the value out there. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I I would do videos where I'd recap what we covered. And nice. so I'd say, okay, you know, the, the, uh, the SEO value was horrible too. It was, it was tagged CIS 163 dash 101, you know, this is what we covered. Yeah. And so, um, I did a bunch of those videos, just, just trying to give them a, a way to look back on what we covered so mm -hmm. that they wouldn't be lost three days, mm -hmm. four days in, and mm -hmm. they can continue to practice because that's a big yep. deal yep. to practice what you've learned. So yep. I did that and it was probably a year or two. Where that's all I did was just here's just the content putting, you covered. putting the content, yeah, yeah. And then people started to find that, um, and they started mm -hmm. to, you know, I, I remember I was um, actually chaperoning some kids at a summer camp, and so I had a week where I was working in a, in a camp essentially, yep. and I just checked in my YouTube. This is the summer, yeah, and I had a thousand views on one of my videos, and I'm like. That's I weird. Do not have a thousand videos or a thousand <laughs> students. In fact, I have no students right now. Um, and I started getting comments like, "Can I have more? Can I have yeah, more? What about?" Yeah, yeah. You know, and there was just, I realized that there's a lot of people out there who, who were like I was. You yeah. know, I started as a developer, again, deep into the pool, trying to learn on my own, going down the wrong path, uh -huh. figuring out later, feeling inadequate because I didn't know what to learn or how to learn. 
-hmm. And so, you know, I thought, Hey, I can make, I can make their journey easier mm -hmm. because I've already gone through this. And mm -hmm. so that's what I did. Uh, nice. I started making videos for them just to say, Hey, hopefully I can make your journey easier. Uh, and that's one of the things I say in all my videos, my goal is to make learning C sharp easier. Uh, and that's because that's where I came from is the hard way. And yeah. I don't want the hard way for anybody else because there's, that's hard. It's difficult. It's discouraging. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And a lot of people drop off as because of, yeah. because yeah. of that. And it's, yeah. it's not, they could be great developers. Um, yeah. And sometimes, you know, you get so discouraged when you feel like you've been struggling and struggling and struggling. And what you don't realize is you're a foot away from the peak. Yeah. You know, you're a foot away from yep. the peak of the mountain. Yep. And sometimes you give up a foot away. Yeah. Just having someone alongside us say, hey, you can do this. Yep. Um, you're it so helps. close. Yeah. It helps. And, you know, I I like being able to do that. So so why C Sharp? How did you end up writing C Sharp? You know, there's thousands of languages in the world. Why not Scala or Lua or, you know, C? What? How did you end up there? <laughs> not C. <laughs> Been there? No. Header files are the work of the devil. I'll Sorry. tell you that Sorry, much. I'm but not, yeah. <laughs> I love to see developers, but that's not for me. Um, so, God. yeah, I, I think I lost count at like 24 languages that I programmed in professionally. Nice. nice. You know, because a developer, uh, as a consultant developer, you play I was with throwing to everything. Yeah. You know? And so... You know, can you do this? Sure, why not? Uh, I'll just <laughs> and then go it. learn it. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I I started off in Visual Basic, the original, old school, and so then I, you know, that was my primary language. And then, you know, VB6 was the best language on the planet um, for developing rapid applications. And so that's why I did most of my work in. And then mm -hmm. when .NET came around, I was, you know, I was thrilled to have it transition to VB.NET, and then realized that's really just a a stepping stone at C sharp. And so I, I started mm -hmm. into C sharp. I liked it a lot. Um, I did like the structure of it and the style of it. Um, I said, I've, I've developed in C and C plus plus and Java and all the rest. I liked that yep, structure. Yep, yep. And so C sharp was just, it had some rough times, but it was yep. a good language. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It struggled a little, but uh... Uh, just a little, but you know, go silver light. Um, but, you know, it's, it's always been a great language to, to build something in, you know, it's it, it's the middle point, you know, yeah. there's, there's, it's not a drag and drop language. Um, it's got a lot of power. You can build whatever you want, but at the same yeah. time, it's not C or C plus plus where you're starting off with, okay, I got 10,000 lines of code to render a window, yeah. you know, and you're yeah. like, there's a, there's a balance there that that's great. Uh, and right. then, you know, it, they've, they've only made it better once they decide that, you know, .NET core is way to go. And they've, mm -hmm. they've done a lot of great things recently. Yeah. So it's, yeah. It's been a great language to to grow up on. I mean, it's been 20, it's, 20 years. It's 20 years now. You know? And, it, and so it's everywhere. It, like, it's, you know, it's, it's now you can build mobile, web, embedded systems. You can do it, whatever you want with C Sharp. Now right. with Blazor, you're in the browser now. You know, you have no idea how happy that I was talking to Daniel Roth and Steve Sanders. I said, you guys, you know, it's, it's crazy just how, uh, you know, where these technologies come from. You know, I asked Steve Sanders in this question, I said, how'd you come up with that? He doesn't want to take credit for it. He just, well, WebAssembly was out there. So the kind of joke wrote itself. Let me just go out there and just connect it to C Sharp. I talked to David Fowler and he said, I can't believe I met this guy at a conference in Oslo. And he said to me, yeah, I'm working on C Sharp in the browser. I was, he's like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> what did you just say right now? So we, we tried this a lot. Like you said, Silverlight. We tried this a lot in the past, but, uh, you know, this time might be might be the time. So let me, I let me, so. pull, yeah. So, so let me pull back a little bit into your personal life. Where, where are you originally from? Where did you grow up? And, you know, what kind of, what kind of, so, so what kind of schooling you had to take? You know, how did you, you know, grow up? Were you always living in the same place? How, how did that work out for you? Mm -hmm. So I grew up, I was born and raised in Pennsylvania, Northeast okay. Pennsylvania, right outside of Scranton. Uh, okay. So, if you're so, the so, office, so Michael, Michael Scott, you know, Dwight <laughs> Schrute. <laughs> Pretty close. Uh, I tell people that if you, if you watch the opening of The Office, there's like the, uh, the grainy, uh, like dark, snowy, uh, mm -hmm. that's actually Scranton. And then they switch over to like the, the nice California. clean sidewalks and the palm trees. That's not Scranton. That's California. Um, that's, that's California. <laughs> Pretty much California. Um, because it's, it's, it's cold and snowy and yeah. 
yeah. miserable a lot in Scranton. <laughs> um, but but yeah, so I grew up in the the Northeast, and um, you know, growing up, I didn't have a lot of computer access. Like I said, mm-hmm. I started when I was twelve. Mm-hmm. Um, had a computer. I got a, we actually got a computer with internet access when I was a senior. Um, mm-hmm. That's a big deal. Uh, mm-hmm. I believe it's a mm-hmm. Pentium. 200 megahertz computer yep, Pentium yep. that was um, the that was the one <laughs> yeah well i was i was actually a little bit irritated my parents because there was a 233 out of the time and i'm like wow. you're leaving 33 megahertz on the table right here you gotta get the 233 not the 200 because you know we're yep. so far behind now yeah um, yeah yeah it was it was quite the system but uh compact for sario so <laughs> right. so that was you know really my my upbringing i was intending to be an electrical engineer mm. You know, and so um, when I was growing up, I was an avid reader. I mean, I yep, was yep. voracious in my reading. Um, I would I would read, you know, a thousand pages a week kind of thing. Like you're, I was you're just... very academic. I have to even the way you speak, you're very calculated. I love it. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Keep going. Yeah. yeah. I, well, I didn't have a whole lot of other things. You know, I didn't watch yeah. TV. I mm-hmm. didn't have a games. I had an Atari, but I didn't play it a whole lot. Um, so I, reading was my thing. Um, yeah. I actually picked out electrical engineering after reading through the entire wor- world book encyclopedia oh and picking God. out, I'm like, that's the thing I wanted. Um, <laughs> so, and it turns out it nice. wasn't, um, I actually wanted to be a <laughs> software developer. Yep. I liked electrical engineering because of the, the computer aspect yep. and the, you know, computation uh, and yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Those classes, now the math, kick yep. my butt. the math, yeah. oh, <laughs> freshman year. I was just, it was brutal. Um, but the, the computer side of things, you know, I, I read a book through my C class. I took mm-hmm. C and mm-hmm. just read a book there because I was like, this is all obvious. It was just, yep. it just clicked. Um, yep. because I'd been doing it for a long time. Yep. Um, you know, and so we built computers, you know, I was circuit boards and that was fascinating. It was awesome. But, but really what it came down to was, whenever I got my hands on a computer, I wanted to build an application. Um, mm-hmm. And I, especially when it came to, I wanted, I was kind of lazy. I am mm-hmm. lazy. Um, I <laughs> you, I don't know about that, but yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, well, that's what my wife says. She's like, you lazy, really? Um, but <laughs> I, I don't like to do things over and over again. So instead mm-hmm. I'll write an application, let me let do it for me. Automate, you know? and so yeah. Automate yeah. everything. And that's yeah. just, you know, it, it kind of sprang up into um, oh. you know, what I am now. So, yeah. but I have, you know, one sister, she's six years younger, um, grew up with in the country, very much in the country. I grew up, um, hunting, yeah. um, not a big fisherman. I didn't like fishing, but I like to hunt, um, more like to be out in the woods when it was let snowy me, and let quiet. Me, yeah, yeah. Let me show people where Pennsylvania is because we have people from all over the world and they always ask me, you know, every time you, you, you interview someone from. From the U.S., you don't show us where where are these states that you're talking about. <laughs> this is Pennsylvania. Is this Pennsylvania. is the upper right hand corner is where I am. Let's see That's Pittsburgh. Oh, yeah, all the way up here, Scranton, right yep, there. Right there. Wow. Yeah, there it is. And see the picture that they put there is the one from the office. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Gloomy and always snowy and. <laughs> yep. That's... <laughs> The clouds, the clouds are yep. almost continuously cloud cover. It feels like, yeah, um, yeah. You know, it's beautiful <laughs> up there. I, if you ever go, I mean, the the winter is beautiful, uh, but the fall, because there's tons of it's hills, cold. It, yeah, and, and so the fall, all the trees change color. It's yep. beautiful, it's breathtaking. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But that's I don't beautiful. like the cold, so uh, it's always a bit of a, a downer for me to be in the cold. Yeah, uh, we actually moved to Texas. Um, that's one of the things okay. I love is okay. it's not nearly as cold. <laughs> uh, T- Texas is warm though, so Texas is yes, where you want to go when when uh, when and I and I hear like there's a lot of there's a huge tech community in Texas. Like I know um, Amazon moved down there, and you know we have our own offices down there, Microsoft, and it's 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 becoming more and more vibrant, you know. And you got Joe Rogan over there, and you got yep. SpaceX over there. Everyone's going to Texas these days. Everyone's is moving over there. So, okay, moving to Texas. So let me yeah. so let me ask you this, Tim. You know, you you grew up. You know, you loved reading. You you loved you know kind of electrical engineering, and then you found out that you wanted to be a, a software engineer. Tell me, what's the thing that fascinates you the most 
about software engineering? What's the most attractive thing that every time you see, like, like I'll tell you something, for example, and, and you're going to laugh at this, but I am one of the people that actually still be amazed that you can write words, you know, just type in words and it does things, right? I'm also one of those people that still get amazed that I can get Wi-Fi while sitting on a chair in the air in an airplane that I sit there, I said like kids these days will never understand how amazing, we, we used to, to, to choke a cat to connect to the internet, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so what's yep. what's your thing? What gets you super amazed and excited? Because this is, this is love, this is passion, this is dedication. What do you love the most about software engineering? Go ahead. About software engineering, probably the, the solving problems. Um, I everything I do, I try and solve a problem, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, um, one of the things I do is I record videos, lots of videos, mm -hmm. and there's a number of manual steps in that process. Okay. And I've been able to write software to reduce those steps. Yeah. You know, so mm -hmm. actually I just did a video recently kind of recapping, um, I'm, I've got a C sharp challenge out there trying to get people to actually put something on, on GitHub. Just yep. show off what you can do um, yep. because employers love to see what yep. you can do. And That's a new resume now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. is. And so one of the things on there, just, I just put on there just to kind of show what you could do is yep. everyone thinks you have to have this perfect application and you don't. I've got an application out there on GitHub mm -hmm. that is, uh, it zips up solution files for Visual Studio. So nice. the solution, the project. And it takes out things like the bin folder and the OBJ folder and yep. other folders you don't want in your, your zip file. They can share it. Yep. Yep. And that just came out of the idea that I do this all the time in order to give people access to my source code. Yeah. You know, so yep. if you watch a video of mine, you can get the, the source code email to you. Yeah. Well, I don't want to have the bin or OBJ because that means the it's just too much space. Viral It'll... systems will will take it yeah. out too. Yeah. So I was doing that manually. Well, I can save myself three minutes of time. And so I wrote a little application to do it. And then of course I'll tweak it and play with it, you know, as I, as I nice. need more, it's ugly, but it works. It works. You know, and that's, yeah. <laughs> you know, solving those kind of problems has always been a passion of mine. My, my wife worked for um, a, a small public or a private school that they were doing a fundraisers and mm -hmm. it was all by hand. And mm -hmm. I'm like, well, I can help you with that. You know, and so we wrote mm -hmm. a little program that would, mm -hmm. you know, catalog everybody's you know donations and they would send out emails saying hey here's how much you gave and yep. statements and all the rest because it it saves you time and it makes it be more efficient you know there's yep. a lot of yep. things, there's there's tons of things that everyday people just do by hand they wouldn't have to if we could just step in do a little bit of work for them you know and so it's there's tons of need and for me personally like i said i don't yep. like to do those things so i like yep. to automate yep. those and that's yep. that's what keeps me going well, here's another question for you. What What is exciting you these days and what are you looking forward to in the future? There's always a, a thing in the back of your head, your to-do list. I'm, I, I don't even, I can only imagine your to-do list, the things that you want to do, things that you want to explore, the things that you'd like to take a look at. You know, I have the same problem. Oh, we need to check this new thing. Oh, temporal tables. Let's see what's that all about. You know? <laughs> oh, wait yeah. a second. Sarah log. Let's see what that does. Right. What is, what, what is exciting you these days and what are you looking forward for in the future? Something big that you're looking forward for? Well, let's answer this in two parts because yes. there's the technology part, you know, yes. but really the, the biggest thing that excites me is being able to help more people. Um, that's the goal of that's my beautiful. company. Yeah. Um, and so our primary goal, is to help more people. And that's, we've got some things coming up that, you know, we can actually help more people. There's, nice. so that's what gets us energized is the fact that, like you said, scale, we can yeah. scale way beyond what I can do um, yeah. because of technology, because of the, the things that are out there. And so we're heavily focused on just that. Um, that's what really excites us because there's always going to be new technology. There's always going to be new things to learn. Yep. And, yep. you know, in some ways that excites me, but the biggest thing that excites me and it gets me up and gets me motivated is that ability to help people. Um, from a technology standpoint, um, boy, there's a list. Yeah. <laughs> it's a new list. It's pretty long. Um, mm. Because, you know, again, 
some people focus on just, oh, it's a new shiny thing. Yeah. Uh, but I think there's a lot of things out there that are making people's lives easier. Yeah. You know, yep. making people's lives better. And yep. so, like I said, Blazer has yep. been, I've been a, you know, a kid in the candy store Blazer just because yep. of yep. all it can do. Yep. Um, and now, you know, with, with the hybrid and possibly going on desktop and all the rest, that's, that's, <laughs> that's just really another, cool stuff. <laughs> that's just a whole new level, but yeah, it, just, just showing off all the cool stuff that, you know, I think about the small person, you know, there's, there's large companies out there that can ha hire, you know, hundreds of developers, fine, yep. cool, whatever. Yep. But for me, it's the, I've spent a lot of time as a consultant yep. working with companies where I was the only guy. Yeah, you know, and I wasn't even full time. I was just a consultant. Just contract. And yeah. so, you know, you quickly get overwhelmed with the amount of work you have to do. Yep. And the idea that you can create a Blazor Web Assembly application that, you know, can talk to your database and all the rest. You can have your data in it, and it can work offline. It can be a progressive web application. And now, one application developed by one person can work in the browser, on the desktop, on the mobile apps everywhere like a real application uh -huh. um that's that's incredible you know it allows you to do more than than you could if you had a whole team uh, it helps you with time yeah so yeah. yeah just just those time saving things are really really helpful um i i've had a lot of fun with azure i taught a whole azure course um uh -huh. just because of how great it, it really is if you know how to use it and use, use it well um yeah. there's a lot of stuff there where again I used to I used to work at a, at a college where um, I was the IT director and we had a couple of people dedicated just to the server room mm -hmm. and we had all these different servers. You had Active Directory and you had your Exchange server and you had your um, your file servers and all these different servers. And I remember how difficult it was to spin up like a SQL server and how mm -hmm. to maintain it and how to you know manage it and all the rest. And there's complexity is there with patching and making sure it's it's done well mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden you have azure comes in and says hey you know for what, 10 bucks a month or five bucks a month you can get a, a sql instance um and of course you have to scale from there but yep. it's managed yeah and it's done in like five minutes yeah you know it's done right did you know it's also serverless patches. now what's it's server that? it's server oh it's, yes it's serverless now how crazy is that <laughs> It's it's awesome. So there's there's those kind of things where again thinking about the, the small shops, not just the mm -hmm. big shops. Yeah. Um, you can bring a lot of those efficiencies, a lot of those uh, benefits down to those small shops where they don't have to have 18 servers in the back room that cost them 100 grand a year. Yeah. Um, they can have the same power in the cloud, and they can pay at a price that scales with them. You know, mm -hmm. and that's exciting. You know? Yeah. So there's yep. there's a lot of stuff like that that is just exciting. I mean, I worked, uh, I'm working with an organization right now where we're bringing Docker in because mm -hmm. they didn't have a great dev environment. They mm -hmm. all shared one dev environment. Like, well, we can use Docker and some automation and, and bring your SQL server and your IS server and all that into Docker containers that you can refresh every night mm -hmm. based on your backups. Mm -hmm. You know, well, mm -hmm. that, that makes for a, a refresh environment that's more like the actual production system Yep. It's more easy to work with and test with. And at the same time, it takes you no time to do. Yeah. So that kind of stuff, it really excites me. The idea yep. that the small shop can can get more done, be more like, you know, the, the large shops as far as those economies of scale and other things, and yet not have to pay as much as the large shops do. So absolutely. Tim, what other hobbies do you have? <laughs> this kind of is my hobby um I, so this i said other i know you know you couldn't do this just as a job this is not a job for you brother i i gotta tell you this this is not a job there is more to this than just a job but do you do other things other than I, teaching people and learning software mm -hmm. i do and now i used to i say i used to i used to be a a big gamer that was my thing now i have two teenage boys 19 yeah. 17 
yeah. and they remind me how much of a gamer I'm not anymore. Um, <laughs> you know, we, we played we played Halo the other night. I haven't Halo. played Halo in forever. Uh, and I don't like the Xbox controller anyways. These are my excuses. Um, <laughs> we, we played just a, a what? match. <laughs> go, ahead, and, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, they, they kicked my butt up and down the court. I'm like, I would be like, where, you know, what weapon do I have? And they're like, I'm dead. And I'm like, they're laughing. <laughs> you know, so, so yeah. Um, I, I do play games, but it's, it's much, um, much less active than I used to. Um, I love, I love sports. Uh, mm-hmm. In fact, actually where I am right now, I'm actually in a hotel room. Nice. Um, I'm nice. at the final four uh, yep. because yep. Nice. I can't wait to watch, hopefully Duke beat North Carolina. Um, <laughs> but we'll see. Uh, yep. but, so I love sports. I love being able to, you know, you know, Dallas is a great area for being near live sports. Um, so I've been able to catch a few games and it just, yeah. that's the kind of stuff I do. I, I love, um, you know, relaxing, hanging out with family. That's a lot of fun. Um, mm-hmm. But I don't do a lot of other things um, yeah. just because of the fact that I have a lot of time dedicated to, um, to recording videos, to, yep. you know, run you're, the business. You're, you're, you're focusing. So, you're, you're just on yeah. that. For what, sure. what, what's your favorite food, Tim? Something that if you were on an island and you would get to only to choose one meal to eat every day, what would that be? Pizza. Pizza. Yeah. Pizza. I, I, you so, know what? I agree. <laughs> I, right now, I, and I'm going to probably, I won't insult, but um, they probably don't realize it. Dallas does not understand good pizza. <laughs> um, Dallas is not the pizza capital of the world. It's just not. New York, um, New York, and Chicago—they have York, crazy oh, pizza. <laughs> so I tell you what, Scranton, Pennsylvania. If you want good pizza, Scranton, Pennsylvania, is the place. You know, so okay. when you fly back to see family, um, okay. we have a food list. You know, where it's not about like which; it's about which pizzas to get. You know, yeah. so. I try and get Sabatini's in at least once, and there's Rosario's, and there's Roma, and there's like it's just the list of, of great pizza places is just too long to count. And so, <laughs> you know, we, we try and get as many of those as possible. Uh, so pizza is definitely one. Although I tell you what, mm. Dallas may not know good pizza, but they know barbecue. Yeah. And yeah. So yep. especially brisket. Oh my yep. God. It's yep. Yep. Brisket. Yep. Yep. So. <laughs> you know, you should check um, Minnesota. Minnesota as well, you know, brisket and Minnesota, it's it's very interesting. Like they're very far away from each other, south to north, <laughs> but you know, for some reason, man, you know, it's it's really great. You know, Tim, one more thing for you. You know, what's you know, an advice you would give to your younger self? And think about all these mm-hmm. people that you want to help, the little man, you know, the person that still trying to find a job, trying to find their way. You know, nobody wants to help them, you know, and this is this is with me personally. This is what I'm thinking at one point in time. Just nobody wanted to help me. Right. And I would ask the seniors and they would be like, I'm too busy. You know, just go away. Right. So what is an advice you want to give to your younger self and to the new generation of engineers that are entering this industry, you know, and they're facing maybe some of the challenges that you were facing in one way or another? Sure. Um probably the biggest one is don't give up. Um, mm-hmm. Just don't mm-hmm. give up because like I said, you, often you're a foot away from the peak. You know, mm-hmm. there's, you know, maybe tomorrow, maybe the next day you're going to find the job. You're going to find the opportunity. You're going to, you know, be able to, you know, fix that code that wasn't working forever. Um, mm-hmm. it, a lot of this job is just about being stubborn. Just yep. don't give up. Um, it, there are, there are bugs that I've faced in code that, yeah. you know, I, I've seen other developers say it just can't be done. You know, yeah. Right? Yeah. you know, no, just, just keep, keep at it. Um, yeah. you know, try, you know, cushion your desk before you bang your head against it too often. Um, <laughs> don't pull your hair out too often. Um, <laughs> learn from my experience. Um, but, uh-huh. but yeah, you know, just don't give up because, you know, maybe today's a bad day it'll get better tomorrow, you know? And, and so that's that, that persistence of put one foot in front of the other. Um, and the idea that, you know, if you look at the entire mountain, you know, maybe you're standing at Mount Everest and you're at the very bottom, that looks like a big mountain, you know, but take it one step at a time and, be, yeah. and you'll get there. Um, yeah. and so I, I tell people, I'm actually, I've got a, um, 
a course where we go through a year of coding and we, mm -hmm. we, every week we have a task, but it's, it's one task per week. You know, maybe mm -hmm. it's a couple of videos to watch. Maybe it's a couple of things to practice, but it's one thing. And mm -hmm. when you look at 52 weeks, actually 53 weeks of mm -hmm. things to do, that's a lot. Yeah. But when you look at, I only have one thing to do this week, you know, just, just one. And yep. you do that one thing and then you keep plodding along. Um, you realize it's not that long. And you're looking at 53 out of 53 done. And you're yep. like, you know, that didn't take long as long as I thought it would. Yep. You know, so yep. if you keep just plodding along, um, enthusiasm will hit and you'll want to do everything all at once. Don't do that either. Yeah. You know, give yourself some time. It's easy to get burned out. Um, take time to, to walk away. You know, I've, I've done different things over the years. You know, I, for a while I had a wood shop. Well, I would spend time and just go out in the wood shop because there was nothing, you know, nothing computer related in it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I would, you know, learn how to, to make things because the fact that it just turned my brain off from what I was doing, because mm -hmm. if I just, you know, just try and always do more, mm -hmm. It, mm -hmm. it's going to burn you out. Yeah. So, but if, if you do that slow and steady progress, um, you will improve, you yep. will get better. Things will get better. You will have opportunities, take advantage of them. Um, but, and the biggest thing, if, if you're going to be a developer, if you want to be a better developer, you have to write code. Yeah. You know, I tell people practice everything you learn. And the funny yep. thing is, um, I will get people that will come back to me a year later or two years later and go, I should have done that, or I'm doing that now. And it's like, if you just listen to me early on, yep, you just, know, just because keep, yeah. I, I've been there, I, yep. I know it, yep. it's easy to watch. It's easy to watch and go, yeah, yep. I got that. Yep. And, but if you, like I said, you get your hands two dirty, to five practice projects. Mm -hmm. So for everything you learn, create two to five practice projects, because by doing that, you actually get to push your knowledge even further. Yep. You know, I, yep. I watched was it last year, I think it was with the, um, you know, .NET 6 coming .NET, out. And, yep. Yep. You know, and so I, I watched a few of the presentations and I wrote down the things that I wanted to learn more about. And yep. I remember it was a stupid, simple one. I think it was hot reload. Yep. Yeah. And, you know, I'm like, oh, got it. Cool. But then I actually practiced it and went, this does not work the way I expected it to. Yep. Yeah. And I feel like an idiot, but I'm like, <laughs> I have to know more. And so I figured out, and I actually asked some people, I'm like, what am I doing wrong? They're like, oh, well, this is actually it's pre dot next thing yep. because it yep. was hot reload wasn't quite ready yet or something like yep, that. Yep, yep. Like, okay, this is how you do it. I'm like, Oh, okay. You know, and it, I thought I had the knowledge, but I didn't, it wasn't until I actually try it out. I went, okay, now I understand and now I can use it. Um, so that practice is important and practice on stupid stuff. Um, don't try and create real applications, just create practice projects. Yeah. Because your first version of something is always getting bad. Yeah, trying to learn new things and create a first version, it's not going to work. It's a lot out. to take on. Yeah, so yep. just just practice that. So yeah, practice. Make sure that you just plot along um, and look at your progress, not look at you what you have to do yet. Yep. Um, that progress and keeping track of that encourages you. Trying to look at, I have ten thousand things to learn, and now you know .dot net seven is coming out, so I have twenty thousand things to learn. That's <laughs> that's not encouraging. Yeah. Uh, instead, look at all the things you have learned, how you have grown. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Tim, you are an awesome human being. I want you to know that your influence and the knowledge, it's, you're like just a beacon of light, spreading light everywhere. Whatever you try to help people, you know, there's a lot of people that love your content. I see your content all the time. You know, there is almost no topic out there for building end-to-end -end systems that you haven't really touched on. And maybe I'll maybe I'll drag your foot into ML.net. We'll see what we're gonna do. We'll, we'll talk about that. But yeah, we'll it, you, you have to know that knowledge is everywhere. But delivering knowledge with love and passion and dedication, the way you do, that's what people look for, right? They can read something in a book, but the missing piece here is this heart, the dedication of putting that out there. Uh, you know, on behalf of hundreds maybe millions of engineers out there i thank you so very much for what you do every day i think you're a great person and you know thank you also for taking the time and i wish your team wins and get some of that good brisket <laughs> in texas thanks <laughs> thank you so it. much and for the thank people you. watching yeah for the people watching us if you have any questions comments 
concerns, please feel free to, to, to leave a comment in the comment section. And don't forget to subscribe to Tim Corey's channel. You know, he has a lot of great content out there. I learn a lot from Tim. He's he's very loving and very passionate. Thank you so much, Tim. I appreciate you. You have a good weekend, Thanks sir. Take care. You Thank too. you so much. Bye. Bye.